102, take one. Cool. So could you tell us about the first time you met Dr. King and under what circumstances? The first time I met Martin Luther King was in Nashville, Tennessee in 1960. Lunch counter sit-ins were going on to desegregate lunch counters and restaurants in Nashville. And uh, he came to give a speech in Fisk University's gymnasium. I was a student at Fisk at the time. And um, many students from Fisk and from about five or six universities in the Nashville area were participating in the sit-ins. He gave a speech. I, I was uh, in awe of him, like everyone. Um, we met him personally, particularly those of us who were in the, the uh, sit-in movement. And uh, he gave a marvelous speech. I remember um, everybody being very inspired. When you from first meeting him and you already knowing about his, his reputation preceded him, were you surprised by the King the Man versus King the, the Minister? Is there any kind of aspect of his character that was surprising to you? Not, um, there wasn't anything really um, that surprised me. I know that at uh, that time in 1960, sit-ins and using a use of nonviolence as a method was rather new in the United States. It was extremely new in the United States, and um, some of our attorneys had said that staying in jail and refusing bail was a bad idea. They didn't understand nonviolence as a method of social change, and we understood that they didn't understand it. So we, I remember um, asking Dr. King if he would make it a point during his address to say that staying in jail and refusing bail was a valid thing to do, and he came through. He, he said exactly that, did what we needed done. And, and how did you see that his role as a, as a minister in the, in the SCLC differently from your role as a, a student activist? And was there any kind of friction or disagreement on methods and tactics? No. <laughs> I, I regarded him as an ally. I was familiar with his um, work in the Montgomery bus boycott and knew at the time that he was using nonviolence. And um, from the moment I met him, recognized him as an ally. You called uh, nonviolence the greatest invention of the 20th century. Can you talk about that? Nonviolence. There, well, I'll put it this way: there is no greater invention of the 20th century than nonviolence, because it allows us to fight warfare without violence. To um, it gives us a method of making social change without killing and maiming our fellow human beings. If we can evolve in, uh, into, well, it, it provides us with the opportunity to evolve a step higher as human beings um, into a, um, a more advanced species. Uh, because what we do now, and with all the wars and the killing and the maiming, and as soon as somebody does something that we disagree with, uh, the immediate uh, reaction is, well, let's kill them or let's fight them. 
um, without stopping to um, find out their side of the story. No, nobody, no group of people, no country um, of human beings is perfect. And it seems to me that it would just be more logical and less primitive if we said, okay, you know, what's their, their position? What's our position? And uh, uh, tried to come to a civilized uh, resolution of problems rather than being so quick to fight. In fact, I'm really um, disappointed that in this country some of our national leaders, if they show an inclination to think or talk before they're ready to fight, they get severe criticism from other politicians. That's backwards. That's uncivilized. Uh, I hope that uh, as a result of, of what Gandhi did and what we have uh, developed in the Southern Civil Rights Movement in the 60s, I hope we can um, be better than that. But it's also, um, it takes a lot of courage to be nonviolent in the face of, of violence. For example, you in the, in the lunch counters. Can you talk about fear? How did fear or fearlessness play a role in, in the movement? I get really amused because people often say, oh, you were so courageous and fearless. And I have to laugh because that is not the case at all. I was fearful from beginning to end. <laughs> I remember um, having a class that was just before we um, sat in, typically. And I think that's the only time in my life that the palms of my hands sweated. But I used to be so fearful in that class. Um, Sitting at a lunch counter with people behind you that you cannot really see, but you know that they are a threat to you, is pretty scary. Um, that, that's one of the things that really bothered me. We were able to summon the courage necessary because segregation was so horrible, so demeaning, so insulting, so degrading, that the choice was to carry out this nonviolent movement successfully and eliminate segregation or to tolerate it. I think by 1960, black people were so fed up with segregation. I remember that we said, whatever it takes, we're going to do it. If the path towards eliminating segregation goes through the jailhouse, we'll do it. If it means getting beat, beaten up, we'll do it. If it may, means risking and even losing our lives, we'll do it. Nobody wanted to suffer or or be injured or, or killed. But the, the, the commitment necessary to displace that social system that had been in place about 100 years at the time. And it was tough. And we knew it. We knew that when we started. And so the commitment was there's only one out outcome and that is the end of segregation. And we'll do what we have to do in order to achieve that. Another important element um, in being successful at eliminating segregation was changing ourselves. We changed ourselves into people who could not be segregated. And once you change yourself, the world has to fit up against the new you. 
that presented a different set of options to the southern white races. They had to actually kill many of us, or they had to desegregate, because they could no longer segregate us. We wouldn't let them. You're so instrumental with the Selma March. Um, can you talk a little bit about convincing King to, you know, that this was the next, you know, that you're convincing King to, to, to take on Selma or to join this, this fight. Um, and, you know, there's a, you talked about the loss of life for these, the, the, you know, the, the cost that was, people paid for that fight and the sense of, you know, the sense of responsibility to that. The day four little girls were murdered, in the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. My husband at the time, James Bevel, and I were in Edenton, North Carolina. FCLC had a voter registration project going on there. It was a Sunday, and he came into the living room and told me about the murder of these little girls. We were both crying, really. And we decided that an adult man and woman could not allow four little girls to be murdered and do nothing about it. We felt confident that if we tried, we could find out who had done that crime and make certain that they, they were killed. We felt that that was one option that we had. Option two was that we get the right to vote for blacks in Alabama. And in that way, they could better protect their children. So we made a conscious decision, and we chose option two to get the right to vote, and made a promise to ourselves, to each other, and to God that no matter how long it took us, we were going to work on getting the right to vote. One thing that's not widely understood is that The murder of those little girls was horrible. And the only thing that would have been more horrible would have been if nothing positive came out of it. But the fact is that the right to vote for Southern blacks is a direct result of their deaths. That afternoon, he and I drafted the original strategy for what became the Selma Right to Vote movement. He was, uh, my, my husband was responsible for the voter, for um, working on the voter registration project that was going on at the time in North Carolina. So it became my job to present the the draft of a strategy that we had um, written to Dr. King. My task was to ask uh, him to call a meeting of SCLC and make a decision about what we were going to do in response to the, the murders. The draft we had written was just so we'd have a possibility of something that we could do. It was fine with us if the organization decided to do something totally different or decided to do nothing at all. But our point was, let's meet and make a decision. So I took the draft to uh, Atlanta. That's where uh, Martin and uh, that's where he was at the time. 
And the first person I saw was Reverend Shuttlesworth. And um, actually, I presented it to him. And his response was, we'll see what Martin thinks. And then I did um, find Martin and present it to him. His initial, well, I, ha I should say that the things that we were advocating such as really shutting the state of Alabama down, um, physically blocking transportation, um, airports, and, and et cetera. What we were um, advocating was going to take a lot of courage, but there was a whole state full of black people who were upset, sad, angry and wanted to do something. In addition, there were people throughout the country, uh, blacks and, and, and definitely uh, non-blacks, who uh, were going to be supportive, I felt. But anyway, Dr. King's initial reaction was kind of, oh, Diane, get real. <laughs> And um, it took us, uh, well, we worked, and by us, I mean Jim Bevel and me, we worked uh, for the next four months to um, try to persuade Andy Young and Dr. King to go into Alabama on, a, on, on this voter registration. Um, Andy was the executive director of SCLC at the time. And we, we were not successful in in persuading them. So Bevel was the uh, director of direct action. And he and I decided that he should take a few of his direct action staff and go into Alabama and start working. He could have been fired for insubordination, but we felt if he could not get fired for a couple of months, the organization in Alabama, the, the Alabama people would ask Dr. King to come over, and that's what happened. In the meantime, I was expecting our second child, and I had a toddler, and we lived kind of on the outskirts of Atlanta, and I made the supreme sacrifice of the family car um, to, for him and, and the staff, his staff to go to Alabama. And I started writing pamphlets and gathering statistics, uh, you know, how many blacks were in which counties and, you know, that type of thing. And so um, they worked for a couple of months, and the blacks in Alabama asked Martin to come in. And uh, that was the beginning of the Selma Right to Vote movement which ended uh, with the march over Edmund Pettus Bridge and with the um, Interstate Commerce Commission ruling that interstate, uh, wait, that's wrong. <laughs> that, I, I got the freedom ride mixed up there. But it um, ended with the Edmund Pettus Bridge and actually with blacks in the southern states gaining the right to vote. Let's jump to the end of the, the Voting Rights Act passing. It's one of the great successes of, of, of American history is that from your, your, your note to the passage of the Voting Rights Act, were you surprised at the eventual passage of the signing of the law? I did not know exactly what form it would take, but I was not surprised at blacks getting the right to vote in the South because Bevel and I were not going to stop working on it until it happened or until we died or, or something. So it was not a surprise. So uh, Jesse Jackson and others have called it the crown jewel of, of the civil rights movement. Um, 
how did you feel when when is when, when it, tell us about the moment when you knew there was victory that you felt that you had succeeded empowered um, success of projects like the like actually achieving the right to vote um, it w was was satisfying from a deep place. Um, segregation and the being deprived of rights that belong to us was such an outrage. And uh, to be able to organize people who needed and wanted a way to express themselves and wanted a way that they could make change was um, success and things like that was profound. And on the wake of that success, um, you know, what's, there's uncertainty it seemed in the movement about what, what the next fight would be. And um, the idea of going towards, you know, pivoting towards Chicago and a sort of northern strategy, there's, uh, how did you feel about that? Were you part of those discussions about what, what to do next? I opposed SCLC moving north because we weren't finished in the south. Uh, there was a lot of work left to be done. And I thought that we should have stayed in the South and done it. Why is that? For example, what other, what would you, if you were leading the movement, what would, you, what would your next fight have been? I think that we needed to continue political education in the South. Um, learning what the rights and responsibilities of citizens and voters uh, were, making certain that blacks who were elected to political office understood that they needed to represent their constituents rather than to consider their positions their own personal jobs. Um, there was uh, a great deal left to be done with the political. And then with the economics, um, we needed to work on building an economic base in the South. Um, education. There were many things uh, left undone. The education level of black children were nowhere near on par with the education level of white children that needed to be corrected. So I, I thought that there were just many, many things that we needed to uh, build on our successes in the South. If we go back to the Martin, uh, at that time, uh, sort of riding on the high of the Selma victories, um, People talk about he was everywhere at once and that kind of inexhaustible or just running him all over the place. But he also, there's also, people talk about a darker side of that boundless energy, a kind of depression or uh, where it became too much for him. Did you ever see him beca become too much for him? During the period before 1965, I would... Uh, realized that sometimes Martin had anxiety uh, because, as he put it, we don't want to flunk. <laughs> um, that's what the way he said it when he was saying, we don't want to fail in, uh, in, in our projects. And um, I always felt like we are not called upon to succeed. We are called upon to do our best. 
um, I did not have that kind of anxiety about not succeeding. Um, because we needed to do our best, but the other thing is we need not stop until we have succeeded. If you're not successful at a certain point, you go back to the drawing board and correct what needs to be corrected and, and continue. I wanted to pivot a little bit to the personal relationship, you and, 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 and uh, your ex-husband and the, and the kings. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between Bevel and King and then you know, vacationing with them in the Bahamas, just to sort of personalize a little bit the relationship. Any anecdotes or feelings of what that might have been like? I said to um, an audience one time that I had double dated with Martin Luther King, and I was really surprised they laughed. And um, I, I didn't understand why they were laughing. People generally do laugh when, when I say that now. And I think it's because they don't associate Martin Luther King with dating. Um, but he was very human and um, not at all the perfect, superhuman, saintly, uh, remote kind of uh, impression that a lot of people, a lot of young people especially, have. Um, he was very human, and his humanness was one thing that I found endearing about him. He had a sense of humor. He, I remember he often enjoyed playing table tennis with the staff and talking smack <laughs> and laughing. And it was just really, really clear that uh, he was having a great time as what, you know, as the, the staff was. Um, sometimes they would crack jokes and try to top each other's jokes, you know, a joke here, and then somebody would crack another one, another one. So um, this time, particular time, though, Martin was going to the Bahama Islands to work on one of his books. And uh, Jim Bevel surprised me and, uh, um, with the trip. We were going along also. We were in the Atlanta airport, and I remember uh, we had just come from someplace. And I, I was like, Bevel, we're going the wrong way. Ground trans transportation is that way. And so he said, no, we're going to the Bahamas. And, uh, so we joined Coretta and Martin. And um, I have lovely memories of a great restaurant that was cut into the side of the hill. And uh, the moon was shining through the palm trees. And for somebody from Chicago, the moon shining through the palm trees is a big deal. And um, as you can imagine, you know, great conversation. Um, he was a fun person to be with, and um, Coretta, it, it was a really nice evening, and then the next day a long boat ride, and um, so he was, uh, to me, a likable person. I admired a lot of things about Martin Luther King. I remember really admiring him or the amount of work that he could grind out in a day. Um, he was a person that had an open mind to the extent that he could grow and change his mind over a period of time. I respect that a great deal in uh, a human being. Um, 
He was steadfast. He uh, didn't waver. He kept his hand on the freedom plow, to borrow a phrase from the gospel uh, song. And um, he didn't want to die. I really relate to that. I didn't want to die either. Um, but he did what was necessary to, um, to, to change things. I admire that deep, deeply. There was a lot to him. Um, he was serious at times. He, um, he was courageous at times. He was uh, a many-faceted human being. And in the Bahamas, was the conversation about politics all the time, or did you feel like he could unplug a little bit? Mm, the conversation was about many, many things. We had a lot to talk about. Martin Luther King knew a lot about what was going on in the world. Uh, then, of course, we had the movement, and, and uh, then we, we had families. And um, so it, it was very varied. Can you talk a little bit about Jim Bevel and what was his, how, the people talk about how Unique, you had a sort of unique position in the inner circle. Um, what was unique about it? Jim Bevel was about 10 years younger than Martin Luther King. And the, the ministers that were Martin's contemporaries. Um, Bevel was uh, first with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, as was I. He was a member of the Nashville Student Central Committee, as was I. He received, as did I, a, an excellent education in nonviolence, in the philosophy and the strategy. Reverend James Lawson had been to India and had studied Gandhi's movement firsthand. And Lawson conducted workshops every week in Nashville in which he taught the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence to students who were interested, community people, other ministers. And uh, those workshops were wonderful. For me, they were life-changing. I think for many of the students and community people who went, they were life-changing. Bevel was part of many of the workshops and was on the, we called it the Central Committee, the students that gave leadership to the um, sit-in movement. When we began working with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, um, he and I made a really great team. Um, some of his strengths were um, not my, my strengths and vice versa. And so the two of us together really complemented each other. And I think one plus one equaled six or seven instead of two, if you understand what I mean. Um, Bevel was a marvelous strategist. Uh, that also was one of my fortes. He was an, uh, a gifted speaker. He had the ability to move crowds and um, of course, I, I am not that at all. Um, and um, he was part of the executive committee and had a uh, and was director of direct action for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He had a great deal of courage, uh, very committed to ending segregation. 
he loved black people and um, was motivated by, by that love. After Selma and the after, especially after the Watts riots, this this idea of nonviolence was questioned by lots of people, including yourself. Um, can you talk about the your decision to leave SNCC and your sort of your journey away from nonviolence and back to nonviolence, um, and how you how you sort of contextualize that with what was happening in, in the world in, in the in the middle sixties. I grew up in this violent society, and um, I stayed with those nonviolent workshops in Nashville for one reason, and that was it was the only game in town. There was no other organization trying to eliminate segregation. I really doubted that nonviolence would work. But I also could not just do nothing about segregation. I found it so humiliating. Um, blacks could not use public libraries, swimming pools, hotels, motels, restaurants. Um, it, it was possible for blacks to buy food at a downtown restaurant, but you couldn't sit down and eat. You had to take it on a carry-out basis. So if you went to downtown Nashville during the lunch hour, the blacks that worked in the downtown area would be sitting along the curbs, along the alleys, eating their lunch that they had either brought from home or purchased on a takeout basis from a uh, local restaurant. When I obeyed segregation rules, I felt awful. I felt like I was agreeing that I was too inferior to use the accommodations that the general public used. So my commitment was to eliminate segregation. The nonviolent workshops were the only organization that I could find, that uh, the only people trying to do something about eliminating segregation. So we had the success of the first couple of years uh, the, the lunch counters and restaurants and Freedom Rides. And then the violent poetry um, was um, surfacing and people who did not believe in nonviolence. And at a certain point I thought, well, of course violence is more powerful than nonviolence. And I decided I wouldn't be nonviolent. Well, about a year passed. The only thing that I had done was read a lot of poetry, <laughs> have a lot of conversation about how blood had to flow in the street. And um, I had not been to the rifle range. I had not uh, learned to make a bomb or let alone used one, use one. I had come to the conclusion that you'd have to be kind of stupid to do illegal things with people that you did not know well. Therefore, it was not possible to build a mass-based movement using violence. And when I looked back on that year, I decided that I personally was more powerful using nonviolence. So I came full circle and um, moved from using it as a tactic to using it as a way of life. Because it makes, so, makes sense in so many ways. 
usually when people um, carry out violent movements, they're really trying to achieve something good, achieve a better world. And you don't do that by harming people. If you kill somebody's friend or brother or child or mother or father, it's not going to create uh, good feelings and brotherhood and sisterhood and, and harmony like people would prefer. Very often, when, you, when there is violence, the press will cover the violence and ignore the issue. Um, they will cover the violence in great detail. You know, I remember the convention, the Democratic convention in Chicago. If you read the accounts, they'll say on this corner, this violence was happening. And meanwhile, across the street in Grant Park, and they'll describe some violence there. And then they'll go on. The whole article will be violence and the issues will be absolutely ignored. So I took note of a number of, of things such as that and decided that nonviolence is a more powerful way of making change because often you would, with violence you attack individuals and you leave the system or the real problem untouched. With the amount and the different kinds of violence that have been used over the centuries, if violence improved things and made a better world, we'd be in utopia by now. So clearly, it's, um, it, it doesn't bring a better world. Did the, your, your um, return to nonviolence uh, sort of, was that the natural leap to the anti-war movement and your, your feelings about Vietnam? I remember seeing a photograph of a Vietnamese woman. She was holding a baby Baby looked like it might have been a year and a half, something like that. And part of the baby's flesh was torn away. And exposed flesh was in that photograph. And the expressions on the child's and the woman's face expressed such agony. And I was a young mother at the time, and I really identified with her and how I'd feel if something like that happened to my child. And I decided that if I had the opportunity to help, I would. By that time, I had learned that, I had learned because of the civil rights movement and nonviolence, that blowing apart the bodies of people's babies with bombs was not the way to solve human problems. Not long after that, there was an invitation from the Women's Union of North Vietnam for four American women to travel to Vietnam on a fact-finding mission. And um, I was part of the peace movement and was one of the four women who went. We were there for 11 days as guests of the Women's Union. And we um, toured near, well, Hanoi and nearby towns. I think that if the American public knew how and why the war was being fought, uh, they also would be against it, and it turned out that that's true.
It took Dr. King longer to come around to that position. How did you feel about that? I don't remember having, well, I, I wanted everybody to come around to that position. And when he did, I was uh, delighted. And um, he did so thoughtfully and with good reason. And I was really impressed with the speech that he made um, where he was announcing his uh, lack of support for, for that war. That's a wonderful speech. Um, everybody should read it. I want to pivot to the, um, to the FBI. And uh, did you have any personal, did you ever feel that you were followed or tapped or... <clears throat> Uh, you know, there's, in retrospect, we know that they were so devious and so um, uh, they'd infiltrated so many aspects of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. Did you have a feeling of that at the time? Um, we, we would talk about the fact that we were being spied on and phones tapped and listened to. And... Um, we thought that it was uh, the FBI um, that turned out to be true. And uh, also it was the state of Mississippi. Um, I'm trying to think of the organization that uh, did that. Um, I'll, I'll think of it. Um, but I, I sent for my files later on. And they had things like uh, Diane Nash left home at such and such a time, went to the airport, picked up two white women, one one white male, or you know the gender and and sex of, of of people, and they went to a restaurant, and they stayed an hour and a half, and then they left, and they went there, and it felt creepy. Um, I didn't know at the time that they were following me, but um, in uh, the Sovereignty Commission, this name of Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission, um, but I found out when I sent for my files that they had been. It's and really curious that the FBI was doing that because they they considered us a threat to the United States when we were doing things like trying to get the right to vote for everybody and uh, were nonviolent and, um, you know, trying to do away with segregation on Greyhound and Trailway and lunch counters. It really makes me wonder, well, who were they if they considered people like us the enemy, or a threat to them. And we know from the from the revealing of these wiretaps that they would obviously bugged uh, Dr. King's, you know, his hotel rooms and uh, trying to get dirt on his on, on his marriage and all that. Um, Despicable that they would do that. That they would um, wiretap Martin Luther King and uh, just. Despicable. But surprising or not surprising? Now that I know the kinds of things that uh, the FBI did, um, I'm not surprised at much. A at the time, I did not expect it. What would you say to those people who look at these the, the revelations in those tapes and try to use dirt against Dr. King to um, negate his, his work and the, and the movement as a whole? I don't know any perfect human beings. Um, that, that's all. They, they really don't have uh, their intentions in the right place. And so after the, so for you personally, after this, after the, your work with the anti-war movement, did you, what was your, did you have another fight or was your next, what was your next fight? 
I worked with uh, tenant organizing in Chicago. I moved back to Chicago. My family was there after I was divorced. I had two small children. Um, I had a number of, of jobs that were um, not freedom, well, they were a lot tamer <laughs> um, organizations. One of the difficult things for me then was making the transition from having been in the South. For example, in Nashville, the Central Committee was approximately 30 students and two ministers. And part of our nonviolent training was that a, if one person is getting severely beaten, a way that you can try to protect them is putting your body between them and harm, especially if there's more than one person, but even if there's just one person. Um, it was an ex extremely unique experience to be part of a group of about 30 people that you loved enough to put your body between them and her and to have every confidence that they would put their body between you and her. And that was the relationship that existed in, the, in Nashville in the Central Committee. And th these were the people who were giving guidance to the sit-in movement there. When I came to Chicago, I was working with organizations where people were not nearly so committed. I was, for example, I was doing tenant organiz organizing for a particular organization. And, oh my goodness, they had so many reports that were needed. There was the funding agency that I had to do a report for. I had to do a report for the board of directors of that organization. I had to do a report for the um, board that was in charge of my project and I had to report to the executive director. And he was always upset because I would get reports in late sometimes. And one day, in utter exasperation, I said to the executive director, who was my boss, I said, if I just got all my reports in on time and never got in the field and uh, worked with the tenants, you'd be satisfied, wouldn't you? And he said, yes, yes, I would, please. Those tenants, it was, you know, Chicago winters can be vicious. I was working with people who had no heat. I was working with a family that um, a woman said that she had a baby. And when she came home from the hospital with the baby, she couldn't stay in her apartment. She moved in with a relative because she was afraid the rats would eat the baby. Um, there was another apartment where the apartment upstairs was vacant and somebody had come in to steal the, uh, the, uh, the pipes and, and, and things from the sink upstairs and they hadn't bothered to cap them and water had run into her apartment from upstairs. And she's wa walking around in water a, a couple of inches deep in her apartment in, in the winter. People were in dire straits. And so I felt a need to put more, of a, more time than my boss wanted me to in trying to um, help, help these people. And when he said yes, I'd be delighted if you would just get your, your reports in, even if it meant you didn't have any time to work 
with, with the tenants. That was such a contrast um, from working with people who were so committed and to the issue as well as to me personally and me committed to them that it was just hard for me to make that adjustment. We've talked to Marion Wright Edelman and she talks about how his message has been, she, talk, she calls it trivialized and sanitized. Um, how do you feel that we do remember King or misremember King and how, would you, how do you think that we should remember King and his work? I'm gonna quote my ex-husband on this question of how we should remember Martin Luther King. Bevel said, you know, the Wright brothers were probably pretty good guys. Wouldn't it be a shame if we had a holiday once a year where we praised the Wright brothers and talked about how great he wa they were instead of developing their contribution, instead of developing aviation. With Martin Luther King, we have the holiday and talk about how wonderful he was. But we really should develop his work, which was nonviolent social change. We should study nonviolence and apply it and develop it. Do you see nonviolence as an as a answer me, to this? Let me say Go something. Ahead. Back in the nineteen sixties we did not know if nonviolence would work. Now we know that it does. So I think we should take advantage of it and indeed bring about the better society that we can. And with the cynicism that we have today and the, the current the election you know, of Donald Trump, do you feel, how does that, uh, when you tell people to be nonviolent and, and so social change, do you, do you find that, is that message as receptive today as, as, as you think it should be? Is your, do you have thoughts about nonviolence and its place in 2017, 2018? In 2017, we are in what I regard as a frightening period in the history of this country. I'm a patriot. I really think that we no longer have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. I think we have a, now we have a government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. I'm troubled that we no longer have a free press. We have a corporate press, corporate media. The Supreme Court has ruled with Citizens United that it's legal for our wealthy people to buy politicians. I think we're in a serious place when it comes to the country that our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren will inherit. And it's up to us to determine what that country will be like. When citizens see the roof leaking in their living unit, if they live in an apartment, they call the maintenance crew. If they live in uh, uh, their own home, they call a plumber. Because they know that if that leak is neglected, that eventually the living unit will become uninhabitable. It's remarkable that people don't understand that that's
principle is true also of a society, of a country, of a state, of a city, and of a community. When you see, well, societies don't collapse in a single day or a single year. They collapse over a period of time with millions and millions and millions of flaws. And the flaws are when citizens see something wrong. If you work for a com company and you know they're dumping toxic waste in a nearby stream or lake, and you do and say nothing, that's contributing to, that's like a leak in the ceiling. That's contributing to the fall of this country. If you work in a court and you know that a judge is taking bribes, that's contributing to the downfall of our justice system. And on and on. And right now, all of our systems are imploding. Our education system, and certainly in large cities, our so-called justice system, which is an injustice system, where um, people are, are incarcerated in order for there to be the new slavery, the new Jim Crow. Um, the education system, the economic system, which has an incredible of people unemployed. And the citizens of this country don't understand that it's our responsibility, everybody's responsibility. There are 300 million of us. When jobs were moved overseas for the benefit of a small minority of people, all of us did nothing, said nothing, probably didn't think about it, but that was our responsibility to think about it. How many American citizens sit in a quiet corner sometime and say, how do I want the education system in this country or in this state or this city to be? How do I want the economic system here to be? Now, if you don't do that, why would you be surprised when somebody else builds the systems the way they want them, to your detriment? When the G20, or the numbers change depending on how many governments are represented, but when those summits meet, you know from the beginning they are not going to be making decisions to benefit you. Why aren't you deciding how you want the economic system to work and then going, why don't you go door to door in your block and in your neighborhood and have a meeting of people and make decisions about how you want things to look and how you are going to get from the point where you are now to the point where you collectively want to be. You have the same equipment that the people who are making the decisions have. One head, two eyes, one brain, two hands, same internal organs. The only thing that's different is that you don't see yourself as a ruler of this country in a democracy or even a republic. The citizens are the rulers of this country. We don't need to worry about who's the president or who's in Congress and what they're doing wrong. The biggest people, I mean, the, the biggest wrong, the biggest neglect has been that we citizens are not doing our job. And if we start doing our job, we won't have to worry about the elected officials. It is a huge mistake to expect elected officials to do what needs to be done in the interest of this country. Suppose 
we had waited for elected officials to desegregate lunch counters and restaurants or desegregate interstate bus travel or get the right to vote in the South. Fifty some odd years later, I am convinced we would still be waiting. And I promise you, if citizens don't take the interests of this country into our own hands, learn how to use nonviolence, and make the necessary social changes, 50 years from now, those changes will not be made. And God help our grandchildren and great-grandchildren if we citizens don't step up to the plate. And I don't mean a, a few, or I don't mean that you should say somebody ought to, or they ought to. I mean you, the person you see in the mirror. That is your responsibility. So just as your living unit can become uninhabitable. Your city, your state, your country will become more and more uninhabitable. Right now, black men and boys who are unarmed can be shot in the back. No one held accountable, particularly shot by law enforcement. The the cities where this happened have become uninhabitable for them. Keep neglecting our responsibilities as citizens. It will become uninhabitable for you. That's part of the human condition. Um, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, yeah. Yes. Um, the, there are lessons that can be learned from the movement of the 60s. One of them is that charismatic leadership, whether under Marcus Garvey, Elijah Muhammad, uh, Malcolm X, Martin King, um, Jesse Jackson, whomever, has, never free, has not freed us and never will. I think that uh, the freedom is uh, adult men and women understanding that they are their own leaders. It is rather dangerous to rely on charismatic leadership. Uh, the model of that one strong person and many weak people will sometimes produce a benevolent leader like a Martin Luther King, but it also will produce a Hitler type. There are lots of reasons why charismatic leadership is not the best way to go. Another is that it makes it really easy for the power structure, the opposition, to manipulate a movement through bribery, uh, threats, and assassination if there is a leader. Movements really need to be issue-led, not personality-led. All of the accolades and excessive praise that people were giving to Martin King when he was alive. They thought they were doing something positive, but actually they were setting him up for assassination. And I don't think we should make that mistake again. As someone said, um, if I lead you into the promised land, somebody else can lead you back out again. I think there's wisdom in that. I think we have to really change the attitude of American citizens into understanding that social change is the job of each of us. 
that's the only way that I think we will emerge from this frightening period in American history with citizens having a measure of, of rights.